This is Movies, a podcast about the act of cinema, and this is our final show of 2021. And with me today, surprise, surprise, we have Hans back yet again with a ba- backwards baseball cap, Beetlejuice shirt. Yeah. You didn't want to give oh, the illusion right. that There's... these were two separate episodes, did you? No, of course not. Why would you? Did you change? Did I you did change, change your hoodie? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I went and Hold took on. a shower and everything. You want to Probably just well, strip I... real quick, live on the, change your shirt? Yeah. Let's give you a reply. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, anyway, today on the show, what we're going to be doing to cap off the year, and I, I'm sorry if you're an iTunes subscriber or Spotify subscriber, uh, you know, you're going to have to just wait until 2022 to hear this. You're not going to be listening to it the night of 2021 coming to a close. We're going to be talking about our 10 favorite films from the year 2021. Wow. 2021. What, what do you think about when 2021 comes to mind? Hans. Hey, it's a different day. What's up? Hey, yeah. Just, <laughs> well, you're 12 hours ahead or something, right? You're over in Asia, you know? No. So it's all, it's daytime there, which is what the, the light we're seeing on your on your guns One is. One hour behind. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out my life. Six in the morning? Yeah. I'm in Philippines right now. It's uh, 2022 already, and uh, we're poor. Uh, yep. What were you, <laughs> what's uh, your the question? The question was, <laughs> what comes to mind when you think about the year 2021? Um, uh, the Matrix, uh, yeah, uh, bad uh, sequels to franchises. That if we were to do a a list of the worst movies that we saw this year, my whole list was just either third or fourth or sequels to other movies that made a lot of money. So I feel like this year there were at least five that I hated that were completely unnecessary. Um, so the, that the year does of seem the bad to be sequel. a bit. I mean, that could be any year, really. But that does se- seem to be a big trend this year because they all got held over from last year. So we had an abundance of them. Was Black Widow this year? I feel like it was probably early this year or late last early, year. Early, I, I think it was early this year. Yeah, you got the yeah. Venom movie. You got uh, Conjuring, Paranormal Activity, Matrix, Mortal Kombat, Coming to America, Candyman. Coming to America. Holy shit! I forgot that movie happened. But you know what? <laughs> I'm looking at my list yeah. uh, because, again, if you didn't tune into the last episode, you just wanted to watch this episode or listen to this episode. I keep a tracker of all the films that I've watched in a single year, either if they've been released that year or if they're just an older film I so happen to watch during the year. And for the year 2021, I managed to watch 67 films that were released this year. And I can firmly say, concretely say, that the majority of them were just... Oh, oh no. Hans just ruined his computer. He spilled it to Kate. Oh, no. What would you, you, you wreck? Nothing. Thankfully, there's nothing here, but... There's just a big flood. All right. You yeah. take care of that. Mute your microphone. Clean that yeah. up. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll take yeah. the wheel from here. Closing out the year in style. Typical Hans. Well, uh, I can firmly, concretely say that the majority of the films that I watched this year were just middling. I don't think they were aggressively bad. I mean, that Matrix sequel, that was atrocious. I just did a show with Mumkey Jones, Kino Corner, and One Egg White on The Matrix Resurrections. And uh, nobody really had a positive thing to say about it, and rightfully so. Um, Out of the 67 films I watched this year, The Matrix Resurrections came in at number 63. The worst film I watched this year, Space Jam 2. So Hans is on to something with all these terrible sequels, reboots. Yeah, that's one I didn't mention that I just saw on my list, Space Jam. It's another sequel, unnecessary sequel that came out this year. Remarkably, I mean, look, the first Space Jam was criticized for being a, a, a piece of commercial art. And there's no art to be found in this Space Jam. It's literally... You know, you could play it as just a screensaver for the HBO Max platform menu. It is uh, really void of anything remotely entertaining. The only thing entertaining about it is watching it as a a cynical film goer and going, oh, wow, they included the Stanley Kubrick Clockwork Orange characters in the background. Oh, is that Jack Nicholson's, is that Jared Leto's Joker? Wow, I can't believe they went that far with it. I'm disgusted. But that's also playing into their hand. Uh, any sort of uh, you know negative conversation about it is just going to get more people who wouldn't have watched it curious enough to turn it on 
which then looks good because they probably count that as a view, right? It doesn't matter if is it's that, on for a minute or half the time. Is that Jack Torrance from Dr. Sleep? Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> look, we might get that in that Flash movie that's coming out real soon because uh, Jack Nicholson, unfortunately, I don't even think he's healthy enough to spill spaghetti on the Lakers court anymore. I think he's just bedridden these days. Um, Are they just going to insert his face like on Little Man? On someone else's body, oh. but it's Jack Nicholson. I think they wanted to do that with uh, Ready Player One, and they probably wanted to do it with Doctor Sleep, and they just couldn't get the Nicholson estate to write it off. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised with however they choose to handle that, and if they revisit the Shining property uh, in the in the future. Although it seems like the 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 Stephen King moment that we were in has certainly died down; it's gotten very quiet. Luckily. We're all better for it too, right? Yeah. I feel like for for a for a period of what, like three to five years, they just started uncovering whatever Stephen King property that hasn't been done or has been done in a long time to remake. Especially Netflix. Didn't Netflix do it like nineteen twenty two? And then they did the one about the horny woman that got like her husband gets a heart attack. Gerald what is that King. called? Yeah. That's a Stephen King one too, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you got it, and the sequel, which sucks. Doctor Sleep. What was uh, it that, that broke the moment? Was it, it, it? I don't think it was it. Chapter two. I think it might have been Pet Cemetery. Oh right, that one was also a stinker. But Pet Cemetery was early though. It was before all of those, I think. You're right. Actually, you know what? Come to think of it, I think Pet Cemetery did immediately follow it. Maybe the next year. Yeah, the first Windex one. A- ASMR. Yeah. Having, you don't want <laughs> yeah, sticky sorry. floor. You don't want the roaches <laughs> to flood in under the door. Oh, dude, the stink of fucking beer is the worst. <laughs> God damn it. I, I haven't even been drinking. That's the thing. I had one beer on the episode we recorded days ago. Uh, and that's it. I was like about to take a nap and everything. And now I literally just opened this beer and half of it is already on my floor. So, wow. so welcome to 2022 being fucking clumsy again. Fuck. <laughs> well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read down from 67 to 11 to warm us up to trade our t- down. Did you come up with a full top 10 just yet? Because you said you had a top nine right before yeah. we started. I got a top nine, and one of them is a short film, so I don't know if that if that qualifies. We'll say nine. And which nine. is better? It's better than last year. I think last year I had like five or six, maybe that I liked. Yeah, undoubtedly. And then a bunch of other. Twenty twenty one is a much stronger year than twenty twenty was. In twenty twenty, I had to put. Now this isn't a bad movie. I really enjoyed this movie. I had to put the Mel Gibson starring film Fat Man as my tenth best film of the year. Now that wouldn't have been. Look again. I enjoyed the movie. I, I don't have really any complaints about the movie. I like the fact that it took itself seriously. I would not have put it anywhere near a top 10 any other year. But 2020 was abysmal. And it was really, I mean, we were grasping at straws when it came to that show. The Oscars couldn't even commit to doing 2020 as a year because something crazy would have won. They would have had to given it to like another round which they never would have done that for Best Picture. I think they gave it Best Foreign Picture, you know? They let it off easy, well, but... Didn't Nomadland win? Yes, but was that a 2021 <laughs> film? Because it, the, the uh, year stretched from 2020 into early 2021. The cutoff, I believe, was February or March 2021, which they haven't done since the 1930s or 40s, maybe 50s. I don't know, but I don't think it should have even been nominated. That movie stinks. Yeah, nobody's talking about Nomadland anymore. No, no. Even uh, as like a female empowering movie, which I guess it kind of could be, but it's just boring. Do you think her career is done after the bomb that Eternals one was? Uh, Chloe Zhao. No, she's got. A, I think she's got another film that's already lined up. So oh. I don't think so. I think they're gonna. <laughs> Good. I mean, think about Ava du- du- Duvernay. Was that her name? Right. Uh, she yeah. did A Wrinkle in Time, which was a big Disney movie. Yeah, and like that opera. did not fare too well. She was supposed to do a DC okay. film, but they like gradually started stripping projects from her because she had all this promise after Selma. Didn't really pan out that way. One trick Which home. have you seen? Have you seen Selma? No, I don't think so. I I might have caught it when it originally came out back in what 2015, 2016, but no. So, so sucks. It really. It's not. It, it it it's one of those movies that get spy because of what they're portraying, but. There's really nothing to it that you could 
you know, the, the visual style is kind of whatever. The performers are fine. Uh, it's more of, you know, this is a recognizable figure that a lot of people respect. So just for that reason, and also because the director is female, then we have to praise it. But like, who's talking about Selma now? You know, yeah. same thing with Nomadland. Same thing with like, well, I guess I guess uh, recent Oscar winners, which is why I think those award shows are going to become very irrelevant if they haven't yet very quickly. It's because how many of the movies that win are remembered or even spoken about anymore? Or when was the last time that a Best Picture winner was a movie that people still even mention? You know. Well, you could argue that about Parasite, although again, that I mean, the the time of that has gone you know people really yeah. are still holding on to that i got a message from robbie goodwin of the loud boys podcast r.i.p gone too soon is what they say uh right. that some people on twitter i think ranked it could you mute the microphone when you spray it's very Sorry. off-putting <laughs> ranked parasite like the best film of the the, the current century or something like that so I look, yeah, I know uh, Hans is making faces for those who are listening, uh, and uh, I I'm not surprised at all. I think they like the anti-capitalist message of it mixed with the the, the, the notion of diversity, even though it's just like a straight up Korean film. There's no di diversity to be found in the movie in in the words definition, but in our modern Western America definition of just not white people, then it fits that criteria. And it's also, look, it's a good movie, but it's not, a, I, I don't consider it a, a all-time great film. It's not even his best movie. No, it's certainly uh, not. But I really love when people are all uh, supportive of anti-capitalist messages and then they live their completely capitalist lives. <laughs> like, it's just like, all right, so it's just a... Fucking movie! You're not really following or, or getting anything from this. You're just you know what I would say. Know, to that? Anti. I would post that meme of the surf saying, "Hey, we should improve society somewhat," and then some guy with his hands together going, "Yet you participate in society." Right? Did you ever see? <laughs> of course you saw <laughs> yeah. that meme. That's the only meme that ever gets posted to any sort of criteria of, "Hey, maybe." Maybe the real way to support something is to live it out, is to enact it, you know, as, as a person, as opposed to just mouthing off on the internet like everybody else. But I digress. Yeah. It is what it is. Look, Parasite's not a bad movie. I, I would find it much more um, uh, uh, ridiculous if they were saying, oh, well, Spotlight is actually the best movie of the decade. Spotlight is actually the best movie since the year 2000. That wasn't even the best movie of that year that it won. I know. It sucks. It's so boring and just nothing to it. I don't even remember who's in it. Who's even directed Michael it? Michael Keaton. I... It was like the last thing that uh, Rachel McAdams acted in that went to theaters. Uh, Mark yeah. Ruffalo. You know, he's always in the important movie, the movie with a message. So that's uh, that's that's the current state of things as far as film goes and, and certainly what is heralded as a a great movie. Now, I'm going to start with my list because I have watched a number of films this year. And I'm going to start with 67, which I already covered, Space Jam 2. Space Jam, a new legacy. There's no legacy to be found here. It's atrocious and forgettable. So Next that'll up, be your worst movie of the year then? Yes. But that 66. You saw, yes, so I'm sorry. going in order. So that's last. That's last place. Number 66, VHS 94. Despite what people would have you believe, this is a big clunker. It is not good. And it's certainly not good for the VHS series. VHS, I, I, would, I would rank VHS viral leagues above this one. People uh, seem to be really caught up on like the Rat Man a prosthetic. Cool, whatever. Uh, I'm over that. Number cool. so one of the shorts is decent. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yep. Wow. I rewatched the second one recently and um, it just doesn't really hold up that well either. The second yeah, one? The second one's the best of, one, too. Yeah. Oh. I know. But, uh... Wait, no. Was it the, like, which one's the one with the with the Adam Wingard short with the eye? Yeah, that's the second one. Yeah. Yeah. I was I was disappointed. I don't know why. Because I, I really liked this, or I thought that I really liked the first two, but... 
I couldn't finish it. I started watching and I was like, oh, the acting here is so bad. <laughs> it's just, yeah, I couldn't get into it. But anyway, keep going. Anyway, number 65 is Soul Pursuit, starring Eric and Eliza Roberts. Now, this is a 2B film, <laughs> and uh, I believe it was shot with cell phones. We watched the trailer to this nice. on our episode, uh, our episodes, rather, on Rob Zombie's career. Next up, number 64 is a terrible movie called Red Carpet, which is about the same quality as Soul Pursuit. I, uh, I saw the art to this on one, two, three movies, and I was like, oh, God, this looks horrible. What is this about? And I watched the trailer, and I was like, i got to see this. And it was about sex trafficking in Los Angeles, California. So number 63, The Matrix Resurrections. Number 62, The Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It. Another horrible HBO Max shit. exclusive. Yeah. What a piece of shit. I love was, when they couldn't, uh... they, can't, they couldn't be bothered to go out to the forest somewhere in California and just shoot on like a cliff. No, they had to CG everything. And you can tell. You can certainly tell. Number 61, Psycho Goreman, which is a, uh, what was it? Not Fangoria. It was Shudder, a Shudder exclusive. Not a good movie. Really Portland horror-y bad. Number 60, uh, Fl uh, Flinch, starring the recently released Finch. Buddy Duress. No, Flinch. Oh. Uh, sure. I thought it was a Tom Hanks one. I saw this movie. See that one? No, 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 no. I did not. I don't pay any mind to Apple originals. I might see the Mac Macbeth one that they got coming out because that seems like it could be a real movie, but I, I'm hmm. even skeptical of that. Flinch uh, was heavily promoted through Instagram and Facebook, and they tried to make it seem like a Safdie Brothers movie just because they had Buddy Duress in it. Mm -mm. Sorry. Not quite. Number 59, The Seventh Day. Number 58, Buck Breaking. Number 57, Prisoners of the Ghost Land. Number 56, uh, In the Heights. Number 55, Night Star. You watched that? I watched oh, that. I'm I did. sorry. <laughs> Two hours of that shit. Oh. I watched it three How did you make it to the edge? It was just, okay. it was, it was on late. That's all. Were you intoxicated? <laughs> I was probably. So I can't imagine time. being sober and then, yeah, this Lin Manuel vehicle, let's watch this. Oof. I, I look it's it was so far back I think it was February March April May June July I don't know sometime in that I was probably drinking number 54 coming to America number 53 the amusement park the George Romero infomercial oh, paid, paid programming was, feature that was controversial that one's gotten a lot of really good reviews because I guess people because people are sentimental yeah that's it that's so that it. I, I'm very over that that kind of mindset when it comes to critiquing any film of, mm -hmm. oh, well, this guy was a legend. You know, I, I was talking about this on Instagram on my story recently where Nabiko Obiashi's last film, Labyrinth of Cinema, is being distributed in the United States at, like, novelty cinemas, at um, revival theaters. And, uh, I, there, I mean, there's quotes from the New York Times saying, oh, this is a masterpiece. This is, this is an ambitious masterpiece, action-packed. Well, I watched that movie, and it looks like the quality of Repo Girl, which I think we might have watched the trailer to either on this show or Civic mm -hmm. TV, and it's an old man trying to use green screen, and the acting's bad. Nubiko Obiashi, I believe, was one short of his 90th birthday. He probably had someone over his shoulder helping him who had, like, no creative talent, but he was just comfortable with them. No, it's not a good movie. It's a horrible movie, and it's three hours long. They want you to endure flaking chroma key for three hours. It's not good. Is it? Does it suffer from the devil and, and Mr. Father Morth Morth or whatever syndrome? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, because it's at least, like oh, I, th that one's no. short, and it. But it, I mean, it is a, an old man uh, who is impressed with the modern technology and not being able to see that. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with right. the image that's being produced here? Now, the amusement park is actually an early George Romero film that was mm -hmm. released. But what we're talking about here is that. It was put out posthumously by the Romero estate, and they're kind of messing around with a lot of his unfinished and unreleased works now. Uh, I think to raise some hype around his name and probably get a nice little paycheck. And this Running is just money. something that, that probably shouldn't have been put out as a real movie on Shutter. It should have been like a YouTube thing, or maybe like a special feature on a, a Night of the Living Dead box set or Martin box set. I know that, mm -hmm. I mean, one good thing to come of this is we're going to see a three-hour version of Martin that was in black and white. That was his preferred cut, allegedly. 
right. but uh, the amusement park is literally just like he was paid to go shoot something and he made it a little weird because he's George Romero. That's all it is. Yeah, with his son, with his radio career, that's who we, we were looking at that day, right? Was yes, it George I think Romero's so. That was, uh, yeah. was that the Harrison Young episode or was that an earlier episode? Yeah, I I, I, I don't know. I, I, I just remember that we checked out his podcast and he's just like, yeah, I'm... I'm rocker old guy very embarrassing yeah, <laughs> very yeah, embarrassing yeah. for an older person to be that but yeah keep going number 52 is ear which i think we'll be talking about later tonight number 51 is no time to die number 50 is no sudden move number 49 even though i gave it a harder a harsher rather a critical review than many of these films i was still entertained by it m night Shyamalan's old which is one of the stupidest movies I've watched this year. Um, maybe the stupidest. I don't know. Uh, number 48, Fear Street, 1994. Number 47, another stupid movie, Malignant. Number 46, another stupid movie, Army of the Dead. See, I guess I, I, I'm just uh, a little more generous to the stupid movies than the right. movies that try to do something and fail. I don't know. Number 45, Woodstock 99. Would have been a good documentary without the preachy... Uh, Libby lefty people saying, "Oh, Limp Biscuit is a tool of white supremacy." Uh, fucking, what's his name? Uh, what's the bald guy's name? Fred Durst. Moby. Moby. Mo yeah, Moby, Moby with his um, I'm vegan for life tattoos. Ugh, what a sickening. <laughs> Number forty-four, another short film, AI Mama. Number forty-three, Batman: The Long Halloween Part Two. Number forty-two, The Long Halloween Part One. Number forty-one, Venom: Let There Be Carnage. Number 40, the Clockwork Orange documentary, A Forbidden Orange, which is not really about a Clockwork Orange, but is about political strife in Spain. Number 39, Aha the Movie. Number 38, Nobody. Number 37, Miracle. Number 36, Godzilla vs. Kong. Number 35, The Guilty. Number 34, Mortal Kombat. Number 33, Candyman. The remake, of course. Number 32, although this is arguably not a film, it is a singular piece. It's kind of a TV movie stretched out over several nights. Can't Get You Out of My Head, uh, which Adam Curtis also was a big part of the year for about a week, and then nobody gave a shit. Everybody stopped caring about Adam Curtis and his documentaries. 31, Last Night in Soho. 30, Run, Hide, Fight. 29, Spider-Man oh. No Way Home. 28, The Many Saints of Newark. And I would say this is about the point wow. where I actually start liking the movies. Number 27, Night Walk. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, number 26, Resident Evil, Welcome to Raccoon City. Number 25, Dune. Yes. Wait, are we gonna do a, are we gonna do an episode on that? Probably yes. not, right? Uh, what, okay. Resident Evil? Raccoon City, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to do that with Kyle Girardi, oh, okay. the uh, filmmaker oh, right. okay. and uh, a member of Sam Hyde's team who does, I guess, visual effects or VFX, whatever. Um, I'll save it then. Which, by the way, very rude question to ask. So he, all of you should go back to the episode we did with Kyle where he, what he does is like VR shit, right, for a living. Right. And uh, he was talking about making VR films. And, and yeah, this is his method of work. You know, this is his, his livelihood. You said, oh, do people even really watch that shit? Or you said something like that, just like, do people even like that? Is there really a future for that? That's like saying, that's like I, going to your, your family dinner table and being like, yeah, I'm a filmmaker. And they're like, oh, well, why don't you do something? I mean, is there really a future in that? Is there money to be made in that? Right. You, know, you should go work at Walmart or something. I, I think where I was coming from is more that, like, uh, I don't really see, like, no one that I know has a VR thing, like an no, Oculus neither, or anything but... like that. I, I, know, I know up there, they're a little more, you know, uh, people are more familiar with them and more people have them. But over here, like, I, I don't know anyone that is even interested in that. So it was more of my curiosity. I didn't realize that it came out. Like I remember that. in the moment. Like, hey. I didn't go back and listen. <laughs> I felt it in the moment. I just didn't say anything. I was like, that's not the ah, question to be shit. asking this man. 
and he's he oh, listens well, to. I'm glad he's show. coming back. Yeah, he'll be oh, back. He didn't, he didn't notice sh- or care. But um, shout out Kyle. Oh, I, I didn't mean any harm. <laughs> immensely talented <laughs> guy. Check out his short mm-hmm. film, The Perfect Wife. Very amusing. Very strange. Mm-hmm. Uh, number twenty four, The Suicide Squad, which I can fully admit now. Yes, I was so generous because I was drunk at the time of watching that. But it's also just a fun movie to have on, and that's more than I can say about a lot of the films that came out this year. Number twenty three, Malcolm and Marie. Number twenty two, Keep Pun. Now this is this is a little on the fence because it's like a YouTube feature length documentary. Keep punching. The making of Rocky versus... I had to read the fine, fine print on a little poster here. The making of Rocky vs. Drago, which I did not get to see this year, but it was uh, Sylvester Stallone's re-edit of Rocky IV. Did you get to see that? No. That's when he removes his robot and shit? He gets rid of the robot. Right. He adds in a couple of new scenes, amps up a few different roles. I'm very curious to check that out, but I just haven't had the time to take a look at it. Number 21, uh, Night in Paradise. Number 20... Adrian, which is a uh, kind of a weird documentary, to be honest with you. I don't I really know if this will stay at 20 a year from now. But I thought it was interesting because I didn't know this. One of Hal Hartley's lead actresses was murdered maybe about 20 years ago in a New York City apartment by some, uh, I think he actually was Costa Rican or maybe Ecuadorian mm-hmm. or something. I don't know. One of, one of those ethnicities. One of those. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Right. No, he was pretty brown. So uh, he killed this woman who was an actress in a number of these films and had like a hit Broadway play and everything. And um, it's like her husband doing a documentary on her life and then going and sitting down with the dude who killed her and oh, wow. showing him pictures. I mean, clearly he didn't really. I, I mean, he cried about it at first. And then when he started being shown pictures of their life, he just was like, huh? Is, like this, is this care. over yet? I'm getting out in four days. Um, yeah, but also I thought you were going to say it was a, another Rocky. Oh no 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 no! Um, <laughs> there were these weird animatics where it was like a little animation or something of him trying to explain to his daughter when she was young how the mom died or something. Like, is mommy asleep? No, mommy's not asleep. Mommy's never coming back. And it was weirdly acted and weirdly animated, and I don't know. It made me uncomfortable. But Adrian's an okay movie on HBO Max. You can watch that. You should watch that tonight, Hans, to celebrate the new year. Yeah. Mommy was murdered by a <laughs> knife. Like, the one that he uses in Is Mommy in asleep? Is mommy, <laughs> is mommy coming back? No, he killed her with a with a rope. He choked her. I was like, Whoa, what? What the fuck is this? Uh, number is Mommy support. asleep? Yes. Forever. <laughs> Listen, is no that the documentary? It's, that's exactly like that. Number 19 is Clerk. With Kevin, it's about Kevin Smith, and this features interviews with people like Matt Damon and Richard Linklater saying, yeah, if he didn't die, I wouldn't be doing this document. If he didn't almost die, I wouldn't be doing this documentary right now. I wish people would forget that I was in that movie, and they say it with complete sincerity. So that's how they actually feel about Kevin Smith. And because he's so... Do you so... think he was... Yeah. <laughs> Do you think he was happier about his involvement in Team America than Clerks <laughs> or mm. whatever Kevin Smith thing was just retarded? I, a think retarded so. puppet. I mean, Matt Damon's not even his boy like that, like Ben Affleck was. Yeah. So, it's it, look, I wouldn't put it past him. Uh, another documentary, three in a row, Val is number 18. Now, this this got bumped down quite a bit. This was originally in the top five or six, um, but it gradually lost its placing. Number 17 Lady is King Val Richard. Kilmer? Yeah, it's all Val Kilmer's fault. Um, <laughs> King Richard, which is about the um, William sister's father. Uh, they don't play him off like he's just a good guy, like every other Will Smith character. He's uh, a little more complex, and uh, I enjoyed that. That was a, a decent movie. Uh, kind of reminded me of, um, in terms of just the general structure, kind of reminded me of The Fighter, with Mark. Okay. although that's a much better film, with Mark uh, Wahlberg and Christian Bale and Melissa Leo. Uh, number 16 is The Little Things, with Denzel Washington, Rami Malek, and Jared Leto, playing Jim Carrey as a creep. Because now his personality is just Jim Carrey, Jared Leto. Number 15, Great. this is another one. This was originally at number 6 for the year. Got bumped down. Cry Macho, the Clint Eastwood Western, which was much more just like a general family fair kind of movie than I expected. Number 14 is Titane, which I just watched last night. Uh, some parts of that felt a little try-hard to me. Yeah. Um, like they didn't want to fully commit to body horror or whatever ideas. They, they were just trying to throw around a bunch of like transgressive kind of um, yeah. 
notions in, in a horror film and see what would stick. That's how it felt. To it me. was, it was fine. It's like, oh, I see what you're trying to do here. Oh, yeah. I get it. No, all right. Yeah. Uh, just out, yeah, just like, girl, oh, we're, we're going to try to be super outrageous. And how can we make this scene as outrageous as possible? All right, we'll do this. It's like the autistic girl with BPD type mm. of thing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah it's just, just your letterbox. Yeah. 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 So we're the uh, horny. Uh, is, oh, well, I'll I'll ask you later. Is Titan? Are you? Are we in store for Titan in your top ten? No. Mm. Okay. Number no. thirteen for me is a movie I really enjoyed. I'm one of the few defenders of this movie. It's Halloween Kills from David okay. Gordon Green, which listen, what was it? The Iowa Film Critics Society put that on their tier for the top thirty of the year or something like that. Contention for best picture for the Iowa Film Critics. Anyway, number 12 is the beta test from Jim Cummings. Thought that was good until the hacker guy shows up. Then it gets real Jared Leto and Suicide Squad y. I really didn't enjoy that part of the movie. I wish they kind of excluded it. Number 11, and we're in the top 10, is the A24 film, Zola. So. Okay. That's, Don't know what that is. That was uh, 11 to 67. Zola is about uh, two trashy girls going down to Florida. To strip and was actually a prostitute uh, and it has the guy from Candyman with a terrific voice and Nicholas Braun from uh, Succession plays Cousin Greg and the two lead actresses their names are escaping me at the moment but it was a good movie I mean it was a tight movie it was only 82 minutes or so and I appreciated that it didn't wear out it's welcome <laughs> had some great cinematography but it's also uh, you know it's an A24 film so you know what to expect with the formula there is it Morpheus is that the guy no, 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 no. Not that guy. No. Uh, the dude from Candyman. Is Candy that not Man. Candyman? No, is, that is was that The Matrix. From... Right? Yeah, but I know, wasn't, isn't it the same actor that was in Candyman? Sorry, I think that was Watchmen you're thinking of. No, it's not the same uh, actor. Oh, I'm racist. Okay. <laughs> I really thought that the Candyman actor was the guy that played Morpheus in the Res- Resurrection. Or whatever. Mm-hmm. No, well, that's, uh, that's a very you can good edit actor. that out. If you can <laughs> cut that out, <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> All right. So uh, here's what I'm going to do. Why don't you start talking about well, your number 10? Well, I don't I'll have start. a 10. I have a 9, so you start with your 10. Well, no, talk about talk about the uh, short film on the list. That's 9 for me. Well, then start with that. I gotta, listen, i got to take All a break right. real quick. And I already know oh, okay, okay. you're sure right. your number 9 is going to be. Yeah. So I'll, I'll be right back. And uh, you okay. guys can just enjoy Hans. We guys, yeah. Uh, so my number nine <clears throat> is a short film from director, uh, weird uh, uh, Norwegian name. Hold on. Uh, his name is Christopher Borgli. Uh, it's a short film called Ear, E E R, and uh, it's apparently based on a real life story um, of this guy that's just trying to sell his script in California. Uh, but every character is dealing with uh, weird illnesses. So Ear, uh, or the our hero, has a, a weird ear infection that he has to drain uh, the pus out of. Uh, he flirts with a girl that suffers from a thing where her jaw uh, is falling down, so she has to be holding her jaw like this the whole time. He has a friend that's kind of, kind of a bohemian character that... Uh, out of nowhere, starts choking on a piece of meat that's like this long. Uh, so it's 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 very. Um, I don't like saying Tim and Eric because I don't think they came up with that type of humor. I think maybe closer to uh, to um, World Peace, where it's very crude, uh, not necessarily offensive because there's not like cursing or anything like that, but visually. It's very crude and and uh, practical horror effects. Uh, it's only I think the runtime it's it's less than ten minutes. I think it's only like seven minutes, eight minutes. Sorry, uh, but uh, it works really well as a as a very short story of a, of a guy that's just misunderstood and he's trying to sell his script to Hollywood. He moved to Hollywood to make it, uh, and uh, there's a couple of scenes where his agent or person that he's in contact with. Are pretty much telling him that no one's looking for comedy uh and he he just says well i'm not actually trying to be funny like this is um you know it's just what i'm writing or whatever uh, so 
it's a uh, it's a very short eight minute story, but the special effects, the the practical effects used, the gross out effects were really well, and it, and it's very dry humor that I type of humor that I enjoy. Uh, it's really well directed and just visually interesting. Uh, they do a thing called uh, bloodletting or blood something. I don't remember what, what it's called, but when when you run, you start bleeding out of your mouth and nose and. And that's like a way of cleansing yourself. So it's a, it's a kind of a alternative reality uh, from ours. What are that, you talking uh, about? Work, blood works wedding? really well. Well, isn't that what? Remember when he's running and yeah. then he's just bleeding out of his nose and mouth, and then he gets in trouble with someone because he was bleeding on someone's wife or something. So it's like a it's like an alternate reality, like not really horror, but using body horror elements to it. Uh, but it's also really funny. So I. I enjoy that more than most movies. I didn't I get the vibe. Year, it was so I picked that one. Alternate reality. I thought he was just falling apart and trying to make an excuse. But everyone has like a thing going. Remember the the girl from Arrested Development? She has oh, to right. hold her jaw because her jaw is falling. Yeah. yeah, and then you have her friend who starts like convulsing, and then he pulls out like a piece of whatever meat or something out of his throat mm -hmm. and they have a little argument of him being like can you not do that and he's like well i'm not talking about your fucking gross <laughs> ear yeah. you know so it's 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 very humorous really well shot uh and i, I really enjoyed it even though it, like i said it's only eight minutes uh, of runtime but uh so very that's good. Your number nine yeah all right so yeah. I, here's what i'm gonna do then i'm gonna knock out my first two of my top 10 mm -hmm. back to back and uh then we'll be evened up so number 10 for me right. is a, uh, I believe it was a Showtime original documentary called The Real Charlie Chaplin, which was an extensive look and pretty neutral look at the, the life and body of work that Chaplin produced uh, in the early to mid 20th century. And uh, they get into all the crevices of his life, whether they're flattering or not, and uh, just kind of... Uh, they, they show him in a pretty multi-dimensional way. They don't suck his dick, and they also don't condemn him for the, the very, very naughty, very sinister uh, crimes that, he, well, I mean, he technically was never Of the time. But, uh, right. We all know moral crimes exist, sins against humanity, like marrying a 12-year-old girl or whatever the hell. Right. Uh, he was doing some stuff like that, and uh, went down to Mexico to make sure it was legal so he couldn't get busted, couldn't get in trouble. Or um, softly aiding the the Communist Party of the time, you know. Oh, you know, that. he's just he's silly. He he's, was silly. He's, he's America's, <laughs> America's clown. That's what I call. Him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's number ten for me, and number nine was a Wes Anderson film that came out this year called The French Dispatch, starring Timothy oh, Chalamet, Francis McDormand. And I listen. I, I'm typically a very harsh critic when it comes to Wes Anderson. I don't really like Wes Anderson, mm -hmm. but we're so void of true artists these days and this film was mm -hmm. fine it wasn't bad it was i mean it got me through a train ride i i thoroughly enjoyed it uh so french dispatch is number nine for me for the year i i haven't seen it but i've seen enough of it to that that like no one's making movies like him uh the way he shoots things uh the way he constructs his sets that even if the story is not that interesting which i feel happens with most of his movies uh, the visual style is uh, good enough or interesting enough to keep you interesting to see what's going to happen or what he's going to do next. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like that about most of his movies, um, that a lot of them are just character studies, but shot in such an interesting way that you just glued to watching it. I'm just like you. I'm, like, I'm not a huge fan of his, but uh, from what I've seen of this one, it looks like, yeah, he really put all of his uh, tricks uh, that he has in his visual style to to pull this off, and I'll I'll definitely check it out. I have it. I just haven't been able to see it. It's uh, it's one of his more visually. I mean, look, all of his films are uh, you know they ooze visual style, but I would say this one especially, and it feels kind of like a live action cartoon at points. As a matter of fact, the only thing that I didn't like about it is there's an animated sequence toward the end which felt a lot like. Oh, we, we didn't have uh, maybe something with COVID happened and we just had to fill in what happens here. Oh. I didn't like, like that. the fanatic. Yeah, yeah, I kind of like that, but it's a full on cartoon for, and not even full on like Newgrounds style cartoon for about six minutes of the finale. And it just felt like you didn't need to do that. Uh, um, right. Kind of unfortunately. Out of place. That's how that went because maybe you didn't want to direct an action sequence. I don't know. But 
otherwise, it's a fine film. Uh, a highlight for the year, for me anyway. What's your number eight? Uh, my number eight is uh, Red Rocket, which I just saw uh, last night. Uh, I was very surprised by Simon Rex as a normal actor. Uh, usually know him as the not stifler, stifler guy, you know, where he just plays that role that Sean William Scott will be hired to play mm -hmm. uh, in the mid 2000s. Uh, but this was such a grounded, uh, I guess, um, piece of Americana, or at least it felt like that. Yeah. That even though no one changes, no one really learns anything, no one really evolves or or becomes a good person at the end. Everyone just kind of stays the same. But the the story and the, the character is interesting enough and the performance I really enjoyed uh, that it just keeps you watching, even though it's almost two hours, I think. Uh, but at no time, uh, uh, no point I was bored or or sick of it or, or anything even though not nothing really happens in it uh the the stakes are very low and when he gets in trouble the trouble that he gets into is not really you know exaggerated or it's not a, a uncut gems type of thing where all of a sudden this guy is in trouble with very dangerous people very high stakes it, yeah yeah it's more like you know this guy just moved back to this shitty town in texas and is dealing with shitty people in texas and i really enjoyed the performance from lonnie i think it was the neighbor uh it was just a little weirdo texas character it was really interesting and just the way he interacted with that environment and even though uh i think there's only like three locations in the whole movie uh it it worked really well and i haven't seen tangerine i haven't seen uh what's the other word florida project uh and it seems like that director is good at, at, at creating those small stories small town america uh but uh after seeing this it's definitely something that i'm gonna check out because if they're similar to this then i'm i know i'm gonna you know like them <clears throat> well i uh, i got more to say on that later um okay so I, i'll just let's bookmark that there and we'll pick up because there's certainly a lot to get into with that film and uh it was a surprise for me hmm. so my number eight for the year is a movie we already talked about dedicated an episode to we got the inside scoop on this thing way before anyone else the scariest 61st the uh, oh, dasha wow. necrosova jeffrey epstein horror movie i thought it was very different and that's all it needed mm -hmm. to be it was very different it felt right. like uh listen i understand there's flaws with this movie there's a lot there's a lot of flaws it's a first movie it's a cheap movie mm -hmm. but uh, it didn't really feel like the person making it was holding back from expressing their voice at all costs, which I appreciate and I admire, even if I think there are problems with the film itself. And we don't have many of those. We don't have many of those that are entertaining. And I think mm -hmm. this hits both of those categories. So for me, it's number eight. I think this movie, if uh, you're not watching it alone, it might be a better watch because i really didn't enjoy watching it uh i i get what you're saying about you know some a different voice trying something different that doesn't really work at, in, in in a lot of it but it's it's at least a, a different way of making movies i guess but something that i definitely want to point out is that if you guys watched the last episode uh loris's list was very horny uh, with the movies that he watched, and this movie is also very horny. <laughs> this, hey, this is this is the uh, the only one, the only one where there's maybe lesbian okay. sex. You know, the rest are all right. well. Actually, no, that ain't true at all. Actually, I'm gonna. I'm gonna <laughs> oops, oops. Uh, there's maybe because the first... Red, Red Rocket is kind of horny, but I I gotta, I gotta shut my mouth. I gotta shut my mouth. Gotta, <laughs> look, I, I just walked into a wall. I uh, I fucked myself there. Uh, first, <laughs> yeah listen i well you'll see you'll see very um, promiscuous year for you all right that's fine yeah yeah it's so just, anyway you know maybe because you know i've seen a lot of uh, of people praising it for things that i didn't understand but i i honestly think that for me to enjoy it i think it's it's probably a better watch when you're with friends watching it because there's so many parts of it that, that i was just confused as to what they were trying to do so maybe on a second watch like i don't want to change my my opinion on it 100 percent. but i 
I don't, I didn't get any of what you're saying from, from watching it. Uh, but you know, maybe that's what I need to do. I just watch it with other people. You know? Well, you know, not everyone can have the taste of me in the Berlin film festival, you know, so it's all right. All right. Hey, yeah. anyway, what's your number seven for the year? Uh, my number seven is uh, an Australian movie called Nitram. Uh, I haven't it's, heard of this. Uh, it's a movie about uh, uh, the worst shooting in Australian history, which is why they changed so what, the laws. Like four people got gunned down with a, with a no, something? I don't know. Uh, 35. So 35 people were gunned down by this kid. Uh, but the way the story is portrayed is not the typical, you know, well, this... Uh, we need to talk about Kevin character who was just born broken or whatever. No, you see this this kid uh, who it's kind of weird, like he's kind of autistic, kind of. But you see that he's a product of his environment. And like maybe if he got to do some things that he wanted to do, he wouldn't have turned into what he ended up being. And the way that the movie is shot and the way that the story is portrayed is very different from something like Elephant or... Uh, What's what's some of the other serial killer kids uh, movies where the they, they take where they take no responsibility for it and they're just like well he's just you know tortured in this one uh, they give him a little bit more of a, a of a product of what's happened to him and and his environment uh, I think I think it was very popular in Khan I think it got like a seven you know those movies are like seven minute. Uh, standing ovation or whatever and i think the the main actor who's uh what else has he been in he was in the um x-men first uh what is it called first first blood first Rambo. squad new new squad <laughs> right yeah uh that one uh he's just like a weird pale white kid uh but it, it was really good and really well shot really well done uh it's called Nitrum, which is Martin backwards, is kind of a cringy, cringy title. Ooh. But yeah, how about a <laughs> but, shining uh, remake called Red Rum, yeah. called Murder? Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, it's a sequel to Doctor Sleep, uh, starring I don't know someone that wasn't it or something. I don't know. Yeah, but anyway, Nitrum, great. Nitrum is good. It's really good. Uh, I um, not the type of movie that I'm usually into because it's very serious, but. Uh, it's really well shot. Uh, it's very pretty uh, in in unconventional ways, and the performances are really good. So that that would be my what eight number yeah. eight for, number seven for the year. Yeah, my number right. seven for the year is Judas and the Black Messiah, which is progressive propaganda. It's terrific. It's well done. Uh, Keith Sanfield, America's Joker, the Black Joker, is. Uh, fine in the movie daniel oh Cole i was gonna great. say did you i was gonna say do you turn around your opinion of it no Not i yet. look i'm i Not sound yet. sarcastic right now i'm ragging on it but i actually enjoyed it i thought it was very well done jesse Plemons is good martin sheen is a little over the top but he's fine and i was surprised at just how good this movie was and the director is a very talented young man so uh check out judas and the black messiah on hbo max right i haven't seen it but yeah I've been well. I saw you watch Twelve Years a Slave, and um, so what you were talking no, about? No, I saw Selma, so you went on a Birth of a Nation. Movie. Birth of a Nation. Uh, That's right. Yeah, Sorry. that was that movie was funny. Uh, that was uh, unintentionally <laughs> funny. The what's it, the guy that got canceled? D. W. Griffith. No, no, not that one. He he, he lived a nice life. <laughs> he lived a nice life. They and said died he was racist after Birth of a Nation came out, and he said it was. <laughs> What are you talking yeah. about? I'm not racist. It's like, this I is, showed you, it in the White House. This is yeah, good for you Wilson guys. Wilson just screen this. You think he would screen a yeah. racist film? It's Look, it's right. based on a book. I didn't write the book. It's, look, I'm, I'm not racist. Yeah. I, look, I'll do a movie called Intolerance because of what I'm experiencing right now. A lot of intolerance. <laughs> That's how that No, this one, this one was directed by uh, Nate Parker, Rest in Peace, or at least rest, his career. Rest in Rape. That's what I <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that one was... I don't know. They He made the cotton fields and the picking cotton such a beautiful shot that I was kind of like, you know what? That kind of looks fun. That doesn't even feel like oppression. So that's that was my takeaway from that movie. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm usually... Whenever it's like a race movie, um, because I... I'm not white, white, even though I kind of look white. Uh, 
that shit doesn't really hit me. Like that doesn't affect me at all. So it's usually just kind of boring. Uh, so I, I try to stay away from from those race baiting movies where they're trying to make white people feel guilty. Um, but yeah. Anyway, my number what six is uh, number Birth six of a nation. No, oh. <laughs> come true, which I thought was a twenty twenty movie, but apparently came out this year. Now I've heard uh, of this. That... What, what is the deal with this movie? Did you try Did to get you me see to watch it? this movie? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's the sleep sleep uh, study movie with the blonde girl. You know where they're doing like a bunch of sleep studies, and it's very visually interesting movie. No, I, I you remember, remember you sending me the trailer and trying to get me to watch it. And I said, yeah, I'll try to watch it tonight. And I just forgot about it. So, yeah, it's like a she goes in a sleep study because she's having like weird nightmares or whatever. And then a bunch of weird horror shit happens. Uh, but the way that it's shot is really interesting. I, 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 that's um, if you look at the list or my following picks, uh, a lot of it has to do with the way that movie the movie is shot. Uh, the use of different types of um uh, media i guess and technology like this uses a lot of old monitors and old uh aesthetics like that where mm. even though it's supposed to look futuristic it's kind of like retro futuristic type of thing and i really enjoy that uh this one was just very different from the the typical horror uh psychological horror movie uh, uh especially because it, it's it sounds kind of similar to what possessor did but uh uh, I don't know. I really like the the visual style of it. So uh, come true, my number six. Awesome. Uh, my number six for the year is another film we talked about with Anthony Cisco. That is the Last Duel, the Ridley Scott film that tanked at the box office. They'll never let him make another film again. Probably. I don't know. House of Gucci. I think did okay. So, but this was a, a massive disappointment in terms of the box office. If I recall correct, when we looked it up, I was stunned at how little money this movie made i mean it's not tanking the same way this matrix sequel seems to be tanking which i think made like seven million dollars opening weekend it did really bad it did shockingly bad so uh last duel is my number six if you want a real in-depth uh critique of that and i wasn't particularly generous toward it because i knew that anthony was going to be over the moon about it and i did have yeah. some problems with it but for 2021, I do think it's a top tier movie, um, which speaks more to the year itself. Um, but it, it, I mean, it's certainly a worthwhile watch in general. Yeah, it it had a budget of 100 and it made 30, so that's pretty bad. That is horrible. It's pretty, that's real bad. It's it's pretty bad for auteurs and people that are trying to show something different with their eye, I guess. But he. I know that Anthony was very complimentary to Ridley Scott, but when was the last time he made a good movie? Blade Runner. Aliens? Yeah. No, that was James Cameron. <laughs> that wasn't even Ridley. I mean, or Alien, Prometheus? that's true, yeah. Prometheus, I have mixed feelings about. I, I, I would give it like a C. C I feel like Prometheus, a lot, of, a lot of people are praising it now, but when it came out, everyone was like, this sucks. I haven't seen it since it came out because when I saw it in the theater, I was like, oh, don't, don't, no. And then I saw Alien Covenant, which was even worse than that. So I was like, yeah, that's, maybe this alien thing is dead. Uh, he killed it. Uh, but yeah, when was the last good Ridley Scott movie, you know, besides Last Duel, which I, I think is a, is a good movie, a, a little bit long, but uh the martian do you want to call the martian a good movie no i wouldn't say that i mean listen th that was a fine movie for when it came out but after a certain point if your movie doesn't stick if it's not something that's revisited that doesn't have uh some some air of something to it and that doesn't then i i it's hard for me to consider it like a an actually good movie i mean critically good for the year My it's released and then just good in general are two separate things as far as i'm concerned do you want to say uh, Matchstick Men with Nicolas Cage or Black Hawk that. Down? I didn't know he did Black Hawk Down. Uh, American Gangster. I think people would probably uh, argue at least at least Gladiator. Gladiator is considered uh, like an aughts classic. Didn't it win Best Picture? Yeah, but that's, that's 21 years ago, though. That's the year 2000. So that's, yeah, that kind of sucks. Yeah, Jane Hannibal. Well, he's also yeah, a man in his 70s, you... isn't he? So, I mean, look, 
for for a guy of that era, of that age, to be able to make films like this in his in his seventies, I think is impressive. Well, you know what? Uh, there's something to be excited about because apparently there's going to be an alien prequel coming oh, out, and crazy. then there's going to be Gladiator two. Yes. I'm sure is going to be great. That's so. going to be. Uh, they're going to do what they did with Doc Ock and Spider Man, and put Russell Crowe's yeah. body, his face on another man's body. Fat head on a yeah. fit body. <laughs> Hell yeah. Yeah, that's that sucks. You know when when you have to go back to your good movies to try to milk the audience for their money because everything else you've tried hasn't worked. How did House of Gucci do? Well, did very uh, well. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Well, at least he's got that win, I guess. But it's one that I'm really not interested in watching at all. It's just like there's really nothing. I, I wish it. the... Look, I would, I, I would take it more seriously if Jared Leto wasn't in the movie. But I am intrigued to see House of Gucci. I haven't seen it. Maybe oh. maybe retroactively it'll enter my top ten. Doubt it. But it's it's entirely possible. I don't, I, I don't think it looks he's, bad or anything. I was kind of into the trailer when I saw it, but... He's playing Maniac. What's his Joe? What's his name? Joe Spinell. Joe oh, Spinell. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah that's a good call. Just like yeah, him. Yeah, Joe if they remake Maniac again, I guarantee you they're going to do something like that, where they're going to dress up the new Maniac in a prosthetic <sighs> Joe Spinell face. Great. Yeah. I mean, it's the it's the better one compared to the to the uh, Elijah Wood, just because of that, because he's such a weird looking creep. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, Anyway, uh, my number five. Your number five. It's a uh, Honeydew. Um, it's a horror movie that stars like a regular horror movie where a couple goes to uh, goes camping into the wild, and then uh, there's a uh, a man in a tractor that tells them that they're in his property, so they have to get out. Uh, when they try to start their car, the car doesn't work, so they just go around and end up in a house which feels very uh texas chainsaw massacre when that happens you know when they go and like uh, uh get fed by this family doesn't really want to feed them uh but um the director does a lot of very interesting choices with uh the sound uh the sound editing is great uh it's very creepy throughout uh, there's never like quiet moments in it uh and the story is also really messed up like when you get to when the story actually starts going other than you know we're just asking for help for this family uh it's shot really well it's very creepy uh their resolution is not what you expect you to really get a happy ending that you would think you would get uh i guess uh from an independent movie like this uh the performances were very good uh from people that i've never seen before i don't really know any of the actors uh so that added a layer of uh i don't know what's going to happen you know it's not a typical the typical good looking actor or actress that you know are not gonna get killed just because they're very good looking. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I saw it yesterday, I think, or the day before, and uh, it really left a mark on the, the, just the way that it's shot uh, and uh, the, the whole creepy feeling throughout it, uh, really recommend it. Uh, it's one, if not like my, one of my favorite horror movies that I've seen this year. Um, because it's just tense, uh, and you don't really know what's going to happen next. So, uh, Honeydew. Now, the star of this movie is Sawyer Spielberg. Were you aware of this? Oh, no. The girl? Uh, God, no. Um, the, he's a guy, the guy who plays Sam in the movie. Oh, okay. All right. Didn't even know he was, what is it, his son? Of the famous Spielberg. I don't know. I have no idea. Could be a coincidence. Are there a right. lot of Spielbergs? Hmm. In Hollywood, with that name, maybe he's I don't from know. From Los Angeles, he was born in Los Angeles, California, in 1992. Uh, I'm willing. I'll, I'll, I'll place a bet that he's somehow related to Steve. Right. Yeah, I don't think you would use that name if you weren't. You know. Maybe I don't know. I feel like you'd probably change your last name if you were Spielberg's direct kid. You know. Maybe if you have a lot of, a lot of them do that. Joe Hill did that. If you have intent, you want to make it on your. Even though people know. Right. It still comes into play. Looks like Nick Cage. Right, yeah. Well, it's Nick like, Cage actually know. did manage to escape the Coppola name. Sawyer Spielberg got... is just doing Honeydew. Yeah, which... you could... <laughs> Look, I mean, I, I'm sure it's a great film. It's not Jaws. It's not E.T. It's not right, of course. Jurassic Park. You can, ar you can argue that Nicolas Cage is more successful than any of the Coppolas. 
I know that's controversial to say, but mm. if you compare well, his better movies, didn't we hold a poll better than The Godfather <laughs> when we were watching yeah, something yeah, on yeah. Civic TV? We said who's the most famous or influential Coppola, and yeah. it was Nick Cage versus was, Francis, and mm. I think maybe he, yeah, won? he won. I can't remember; it's so long mm-hmm. ago now. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. My number five for the Look. year, which is something I think we're going to be talking about for your list, so I'll keep it short, is Pig. Pig, yes. The the Nicolas Cage starring film. That was a good transit. I see. I could have segued that a lot better if I was paying attention to what was on my own list. Pig is number right. five. Uh, I didn't want to like this movie as much as I did uh, because yeah. of the hype. And I, I, I don't like the Nicolas Cage renaissance conversation where we're past that now. Mandy came and went and it tried to extend right. into things like Willy's Wonderland and horrible movies. But no. The Pig, ghost however, of the one the one you just mentioned, Ghost of what Ghost. Of, yeah, that's another ghost one too. Prisoners of the Ghost Land, which people were like, "This is so crazy," but Cage has given a good performance, and the fact that it was no. Sion Sono and Nick Cassavetes, right. I was really disappointed by that. It seemed very mm-hmm. cheap. It seemed like, all right, we got three sets. Let's figure out how to use them. I think at a, 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 um, different types of the movie, uh, different parts of the movie, everyone said a version of. What the fuck are they doing? You know, you know, because of the decisions that were taken in the movie, where yeah, it was just it was it was not good. It, it tried to do something different, but it, I think it just failed in every aspect of it. Even the, even the you know the wild Nicolas Cage aspect of it is kind of like uh, it doesn't seem like he's all in. It peaked you know? with Nick Cassavetti shooting the small child for mm. offering him a gumball or whatever the hell was happening in that scene. Uh, everything else worthless. Unfortunately, yeah. Bill Mosley can't even save that. His character's not even that entertaining to watch. It was a complete and utter failure. So yeah, Pig is a good movie. Uh, Pig has Adam Arkin, which is the son of Alan Arkin, in it. Uh, almost unrecognizable as like a schlubby Portland businessman. And Nat Wolf or Nate Wolf, whatever, however you pronounce his first name, is is spelled Nat. Mol uh, Yes, Mole Kid from old is in this yeah. movie, and he's not bad. He's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, it's a nice little small sentimental film, and I was glad I was able to see it in the theater this year. I think we, we briefly talked about it on the... Um, yes, with uh, the late Dalton Pruitt. Movie, um, the uh, Green Inferno episode? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was That's my pick three. Uh, that's the next one, right? Mm-hmm. No, four. That's my four. Uh because uh, are you, hold on, are you again, retconning it to four out of convenience because we're already talking about it? Was it originally? Well, three? yeah, because it, it was going to be three, but like might as well. Um, uh, I don't really hold them in order; it doesn't matter. Um, because same reason as you, uh, I wasn't much of a Nicolas Cage fan until I started watching his crazy '90s and early 2000s movies, uh, where he just goes all out. And this whole, you know, uh, you're supposed to think that this movie is good just because he's a serious actor in it. Um, I don't really f- fall for that or really believe that shit uh, because there's an, enough examples of the movie not being good and his performance is usually very understated. Like he doesn't go all out. He doesn't go vampire's kiss with with them usually, uh, which is understandable because it's not a, you know, Willy's Wonderland like you mentioned, even though you're not re- really hearing this. Um, but this one uh, is very understated. It's very, it's a very small movie. It feels like there's not many locations, even though he does travel. Like it's very contained into what the story is. Uh, and uh, I, I feel like even though the resolution is might not be what you want from this type of movie, like you kind of want to see him win, and his his victory doesn't really feel that much of a victory. It's kind of a depressing ending. But it fits perfectly with everything you saw up to that point in the movie, so that's why it works as a as a serious Nicolas Cage movie. Uh, but yeah, uh, one of the reasons why I, I never really got into his his films was because I feel like whenever he plays a, a, a character straight, people immediately just jump to praise him and praise the movie, even if it's not that good, just because he's not being Snake Eyes Nicolas Cage. Uh, but when we watched this, uh, I was surprised by how much I enjoyed it. So, uh, yeah, that would be my, my number four too. Uh, and rest in peace, that pig. <laughs> <laughs> I think that pig did die in real life too, after the movie. No, 
I don't know. I don't depressing. know either. All right. Well, that Delicious. was your number four. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, my number four for the year is Paul Schrader's The Card Counter, starring Oscar Isaac, Tiffany Haddish. One of the three movies I saw in theaters this year. The third movie was Resident Evil Welcome to Raccoon City, so clearly a very well-rounded trio here. The Card mm-hmm. Counter, I was skeptical that Paul Schrader could appropriately follow up the first Reformed, which was kind of a career comeback for him after... I mean, look, he it's not necessarily that he fell off, but he definitely fell off. He, you know, I, He's a guy who I think is able to orchestrate a good film when he has financial backers and some people to give him support. And when he's working on a very independent level, that's when things typically, you know, start falling apart for him. Um, Now, the card counter is a little more independent than what First Reformed was uh, because they don't have A24 backing them or putting money behind them. This was Focus Features, and I was... Thoroughly impressed when I went to go see this in the theater. It exceeded my expectations. I thought Oscar Isaac was great in the role. Ty Sheridan was terrific. And Tiffany Haddish was uh, not too much for the movie. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm not a, I'm not a huge, I, I like Schrader's movies, but this, this just felt fine to me. I guess because of the year of how it's been, uh, it would belong in the list like this, and that was his favorite movie of the year too, right, Paul? Yeah, I think Paul he, rated he this made it number one. Yeah, the card count was number <laughs> he one. He was his number one. Yeah, um, I, I just like my list is not like the best movies. I think my list is more like how many times will I watch this, or am mm-hmm. I interested in watching this again? I think that's and perfectly I don't think valid. I, I think that's perfectly valid I, for rating films for the year. I don't think I, I would watch or would have interest in watching this again. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's one of those stories where you can go back and, and find new things. So I, I enjoyed it for what it was. Uh, like you said, uh, the only part that felt kind of weird was that uh, we're supposed to believe that this little Oscar Isaac is like this killer. And then he like fucks this gigantic woman, uh, which is kind of funny <laughs> because yeah. I feel like that's a little bit of Paul putting himself in the story. Uh but uh yeah yeah it was good that was what your four three yeah that was number four for me okay so we're gonna start Um, on your number three also i mean he's done this movie a couple of times there are aspects of this movie that are essentially just recreated from uh many of his earlier films like the ending itself we talked about this on the card counter episode which i think is our longest episode to date um although the last like two hours of it i think were something else completely he, you know, if you watch the end of American Gigolo, it's the same thing. If you watch the end of Light Sleeper, same thing. Um, and those, well, actually, you know what? Light Sleeper is a, infer- it's an inferior movie to The Card Counter. American Gigolo, in my opinion anyway, far superior and much more memorable film. And if there is a flaw with this movie, it is probably that it is not especially memorable. But right. I, I think it's a very solid feature and a terrific follow-up from First Reformed. Well, it's definitely a good sign that he still has something going for him, you know, which is not really something you can say about a lot of directors of his age. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can tell he still has a vision. He still has like his own style that he's doing and hasn't really uh, molded himself or uh, changed to uh, accommodate modern day sensibilities i guess or, or try to be pg or or not as offensive as he he was before uh so it's good because i i i like a lot of his movies so i'm i'm glad that he hasn't changed that from his filmmaking and still does not give a fuck about how he comes out or how he portrays himself he's just just him and that's great uh but yeah um my number three it's a movie that you probably also haven't hear, heard of It's a movie called The Vigil. Uh, It's a horror movie about this. So I I don't know how familiar you are with uh, Jewish, the Jewish religion. I'm not not very familiar at all. And I didn't know that when someone dies, uh, they need to have someone uh, sit there with the body praying and shit to Mm -hmm. make sure that not, I guess, no demons or like nothing comes and get it. Sure. This movie is about this guy that uh, gets hired by this very uh, orthodox uh, Jewish man to uh, sit and take care, I guess, of this body that's just there. And as soon as he comes in, uh, the lady that's the husband of the person that died, uh, husband, the wife of the person that died, um, 
she's got dementia so they use that excuse for everything that unfolds after that uh half an hour in until the end of the movie is just tension because you don't know what's happening in this room there's like demons there's like things that are kind of appearing but you don't know if he's actually seeing them or if he's just like fucked up in his head because of things that are revealed in the story uh but the way that it's shot it's very claustrophobic it's very creepy uh they use very little lights uh to shoot it which is something that my girlfriend mentioned she was like why don't you just fucking turn on the light from the room and this wouldn't be scary at all but the way it's shot um it's just a a very interesting way of, of shooting a horror movie that pretty much all happens in a living room, uh, mostly. And then at the end, uh, the ending is kind of uh, what you want it to be because we don't really know if it's an actual demon or if it's him that's dealing with other shit. So it was a very uh, different type of horror movie that didn't really depend on jump scares or anything like that. It was more about the the mood that it was setting at the beginning. Uh, and uh, it was interesting to me to hear so much like, what is that called? Yiddish? No, what is it? Yiddish. Uh, yeah, Yiddish uh, language and, and uh, the the whole um, access or little window to that culture of uh, dead Jewish people, I guess, that mm. I, I really enjoyed. It was very, very tense for like 40 minutes. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's called, uh, what is it? Vigil. Good to follow up with three. the Golem from 1928. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Keep is another yeah, yeah, good yeah. one in that. In that. <laughs> yep. Interesting. And uh, all of those Nazi ex- sexploitation movies. Yeah, Frankenstein's the Army is another one. Three in a row. <laughs> this is all a part of a collection. I think that was number... I don't actually remember what number that was for you. Um, yeah. My number three is a four-hour epic... Uh, of the likes of Ben Hur, Shoa, Tyson oh. Shoa. Yes, it's actually I watched Shoa for the first time in the theater, and that's my number three for twenty twenty two. No, uh, it's actually it's Zack Snyder's Justice League. Yes, it's true. Okay, uh, this is number three for the year now. People were ragging on Jeremy Johns or whatever for putting it in his number one because he doesn't watch real mm-hmm. movies. Apparently, he didn't go to the theater right. to see Pig or The Card Count or any of these films. Spider Man No Way Home is like his number four of the year. You know, that's what do you expect oh. from that guy? What do you expect from him? Hmm? That's what Nothing. I, I don't know him. Exactly. I'm not familiar with him at all. <laughs> but but so I'm not Yiddish. So... I think you had a comment on, on a Facebook group that was related to that. Yep. Uh, yeah, that did happen. Uh, this yeah, movie go ahead. Is, uh, it, it's the closest thing we have to like a modern fantasy epic, and it takes care of everything you need in one go in the four hours. You don't need 20 movies. You don't need like a trilogy. It all gets mm-hmm. taken care of all in one go and i appreciate look we did an hour and a half episode two hour episode fawning over it and then you eventually gradually retracted some things because uh robbie goodwin and mm-hmm. nick oldershaw jizzing all bullying over me for, yeah you know, <laughs> bullying embarrassing me to like you it. that you you like the movie. <laughs> but it, look it's a it, as far as especially cave shit goes um yeah i wouldn't feel comfortable putting anything else in that genre in my top 10 uh from this year or maybe i mean most years to be honest with you but this is a this is a great film in general and again it's a great fantasy epic that we don't get anymore so that's my it's number three definitely definitely improved from whatever fucking that's not even related as far right? as i'm concerned that's not even a that's not that's not a thing <laughs> that 2017 yeah, uh, piece of shit commercial advertisement happen. playstation yeah. game i don't know what that is but, and the, I think the, the, the thing that people uh, fail to grasp with this movie is that, yeah, it's, it is cape shit and it is about superheroes and it is uh, very dramatic about things that maybe it shouldn't be that dramatic about. But especially if you compare it to the other cape shit that is out there where you already know what's going to happen on Act 2 and 3 by just watching the first five minutes or because you know that they're not really trying to do anything different with any of those movies. They just follow the same formula and just keep fitting you the same pile of shit over and over again with just different costumes. Uh, That watching something like this that is so grandiose and so big and and so epic, like you said, uh, they don't really make these movies like this anymore. What would be the last one? Uh, uh, Like the Kings one that I think Ridley Scott did or tried to, like the Egypt kings of egypt or whatever the fuck which feels like a like an epic action movie but it's a piece of shit 
Uh, this one, it definitely corrected everything that uh, Mr. Baldy Ginger, whose name I can't remember right now, uh, did with, when he put the out his version of it. Is what I call yeah. him. Joss Whedon. The, the Baby Tooth creepy, Joss Whedon. Yeah, gummy Joss Whedon. Can we just pull up, uh, hold on, let's pull up a picture real quick of Joss Whedon and his teeth. Just Google Joss Whedon teeth. Let's get a look at this guy. Let's get a look at that guy who shit on Zack Snyder's artistic masterpiece months after his child killed herself. Oh, no, this is a generous photo of him because he's kind of skinny here. Let's see what he really looks like. You're getting closer, getting closer. Still generous because he's young there. We need... F yeah, that's about right. Hold on. No, scroll down. <laughs> scroll down. Let's go to... The, no, 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 no. No, no, no. On the far right here, Avengers starts filming Tuesday. That's about the one that you want to see. Yep, that's Joss Whedon. Look at those brown fucking teeth. Don't you want to just hit him in the face? <laughs> Disgusting. Where's the eyebrows? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. Yes. <laughs> I agree that if oh. you've made money in Hollywood for 40 years or however long, you should probably fix that shit. Uh, but yeah, that I remember how underwhelmed I was with that, with the first one, and how I didn't want to see Batman or Superman ever again because of that shit. Uh, and uh, the Zack Snyder cut definitely took care of uh, a lot of issues that it has. And it, like you said, turned it into an epic, a uh, four-hour epic where by the end of it, you're like, okay, cool. The story ended. I don't need anything more. I don't need uh, 10 sequels to understand what's going on. Or, hey, The Flash did this thing on, on movie number five. So now it's relevant in movie number 10. Uh, right. So, yeah, I, I, I agree with most of what you just said about it. Uh, didn't put it in my top 10, but uh, it's one that I... I think the only thing that would keep me from rewatching it is how long it is. Because uh, it's a commitment to sit there for four hours. Yeah, I watched it four it hours in the same weekend. I mean, four times in the same four weekend. Times, Sorry, yeah. four hours. That's one, one, one viewing. Uh, four yeah. hours is 20... 16 hours, excuse me. I'm bad yeah. at math on this show. I need to eat again, Hans. Yeah. That's what it is. Anyway, yeah, yeah uh, I, I think it's an enormous undertaking to have been able to accomplish what he did with this movie and have it be four hours. And it's just the, the work of an auteur in a medium that is not respected and doesn't deserve to be respected. It's offered nothing uh, that, that, that I feel anyway warrants any acclaim. And he managed to make something within that when everybody was out to get him, essentially. And they, they wanted to see the flaws in it so they could say, ha ha, what a big mistake, mm -hmm. what a stupid idiot, stupid HBO Max. And he shut everybody up. All the detractors from 2016, 2017 reversed their opinion on everything they said. Oh, it doesn't exist. It's not real. It's not, it's, it would be terrible anyway. They all shut up. Unless you're Jerry, who was one of the biggest detractors, and then you don't watch it at all. Just pretend like it never happened. <laughs> yeah. Who's directing the Flash movie? Andy Muschietti, who did the... Uh, it chapter mm. one and two movies. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Not, not the reason. worst, not the best. Oh. Right. Not who. Uh, I, 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 yeah, I don't know. I'm just completely uh, superheroed out. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't really. I can't even get like excited I, for that new Batman movie that's coming out in March. Like, yeah, Robert Pattinson's a great pick and it looks, look, it, it visually looks great, but I just can't, yeah. I, I don't have the energy for that anymore. Uh, I'll go see The Flash because Michael Keaton's Bat and Batgirl, apparently, because they're going to make him a staple now. I, I don't know how that'll work. Although, Brendan Fraser is going to be the bad guy in that movie. That seems fun. He's going to be Firefly. There's a Bat Batgirl movie coming There's out? There's a Batgirl movie coming out with J.K. Simmons, Michael Keaton, and Brendan Fraser. Uh, and it's going to be right. part of the Tim Burton it's Michael, universe. Michael Keaton playing Batgirl? Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> damn, a it's lot of thought and effort Michael went into Keaton. that joke, I bet. <laughs> yeah, since you mentioned Michael Keaton and Batgirl. Uh, anyway, my number two is The Green Knight. Uh, was was not expecting to like this. Yeah, yeah, I was not expecting to like this as much as I did. Uh, but it's one of the most visually interesting movies I saw this year. Um, the story, uh, it's very uh, fairy tale ish uh, of, you know... Uh, uh, you know, stories when we were kids, so you're just like, if you say this thing, you have to do it, or you have to, you know, uh, if you make a promise, you have to keep it or whatever, and then you have this supernatural entity with the green knight that is coming to cut your head off, or Dev Patel's 
uh, head off. Uh, but it's so visually interesting. Uh, and uh, there's so many decisions with the visual aspect of it that I was, uh, even though the story, again, another uh, story that w didn't really completely uh, caught my attention or, or kept me there, but the visual style of it uh, did. Uh, and I've seen it twice. Uh, well, not once, once more since I saw it a couple of months ago. So uh, that would be my, my number two. Did you, did you see it? No, I meant to get around to it, and I heard mixed things about it. Kino seemed very down on that film, um, and it kind of... I was going to watch it like that week, and he was like, oh, no, don't do, don't do it. It's really bad. Yeah. And I was like, uh, all right, I'm not as excited to check this out now. And I worked myself up to give it a look. Uh, it is something I still intend on checking out, but no, I have not seen The Green Knight. I do like Dev Patel as a lead actor, and um, everything I saw from it looks pretty good. He's very good. He has a very uh, vulnerability to himself. I don't know if it's because like a skinny Indian, <laughs> Indian but <laughs> Indian British man. Uh, but he works really well in this setting where it's just like a young uh, warrior, I guess, uh, that gets into something that he shouldn't have. Uh, and just the way, yeah, the way it's shot, I, I really enjoyed it. So uh, Kino can go fuck himself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have to give it a look then. It is on uh, Amazon Prime currently, I believe. So uh, yeah. my number two film for the year is one you already brought up. I believe this is an A24 film as well. Maybe I'm wrong about that. It's Sean Baker's Red Rocket, which I, in my review of it for Letterboxd, I gave it five stars and said it was Barry Lyndon and Gavelston, which it essentially is. It's a dude who gets, uh, I mean, they don't really explain why he leaves the porn industry. Maybe something happened. Maybe he just aged out. That's entirely possible, right. too. He seems to have erectile dysfunction problems. Maybe that's mm -hmm. a thing. Uh, and he goes back home to Texas City, Texas, and moves in with his ex-wife and her mom, which in typical Sean Baker fashion seems to be just some crackhead that he pulled off yeah. the street who can't really memorize lines well. Uh, seems to be struggling with the performance. And um, they, I, they smoke crack in it, too, right? I, I don't know that, what they, when I, they're out of the window and he's like, oh, that's a nice decision there or whatever he says. And, and she's like, oh, they caught Medicare or whatever the fuck. Mm -hmm. So she has to get high. Right. Uh, but, but yeah, the, the mom, you mean, she has yeah. that look. She's, <laughs> yeah, she's she, got the sunken in mouth. It looks like she's 80 yeah. when she's probably 60 years old, you know. Um, yeah. yeah. So you have a lot of characters like that in this movie. And uh, from my understanding, before I even saw the movie, uh, when it initially premiered at, what was it, Venice or something like that. Uh, I, I thought this was about Simon Rex's career in Hollywood because he got, you know, he got crushed in the late 90s, early aughts because his porn career came out because he did a couple of adult movies before he did teen movies. Oh, I didn't even know that. <laughs> and that ended his career. And that's why he wound up having to do scary movie three, four, five, et cetera, and not actual commercial films. So, wasn't he one of the guys from Punked too? No, that, uh, I thought he was. Hmm. Was he not? I don't. I wouldn't shock I, me, but I don't think so. I thought he was one of like the you know the actors that would be part of the prank. Uh, or maybe I'm thinking of someone that kind of looks like that. No, I'm thinking of ah uh, uh, fuck, what's his name? Dax the Shepard. guy that's there. Yes, that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, yeah. similar type of very guy. Si he kind of came similar. in and took yeah. his place in movies. Now, Simon Rex, if you take a look at his filmography, it's really atrocious. <laughs> he, he is very fortunate to have met Sean Baker. I'll tell you that right now. Uh, he was one of the few carryovers from Shriek, if you know what I did, last Friday the 13th into the Scary Movie franchise. So he also did Superhero Movie. He also did mm -hmm. An American Carol, which features... Leslie Nielsen, front and center on there, in what appears to be a, uh, a what I think it might be like a terrorist, like Al-Qaeda style uh, hat, mm. headdress. I don't know. Very peculiar. He's also in Karate Dog and um, tons of other quality features. Now, uh, I remember him coming up on like VH1 all the time, talking about I love the 90s, I love the 80s. Yeah. Like he was only getting that kind of work for a period of time. And he's great in this movie. He's very believable. Um, and, uh, very charismatic. He, he, I love Even the character. He's... 
he plays, even though he's a total scumbag, total sleazy. But he's it's very real. It's it, yeah. I've seen this situation play out a number of times. I think if you're a young man in general, you probably navigate some kind of format of this situation mm. uh, plenty where, you know, you, you're you fucked. You're, you, you yeah. know, you reach the end of the line and whatever it is you're doing, you got to go back to something that you didn't want to go back to and then just figure out a way to stay there until you can boost yourself back up into a new situation. Now, he does that with his ex-wife here. He's, he, he, ha- he has to leave Los Angeles. He goes back to this crummy town in Texas. He figures out a way to stay with his ex-wife and her mom. And he kind of convinces himself that he's happy with this situation, that he really does want to you know, reignite this relationship he had with uh, his wife, who appears to be a hooker and a uh, porn star at one yeah. time. And she's got a kid now. And I don't think that's his kid. That that doesn't really seem to be uh, a thing. Darker, I think. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They really love to hammer (laughs) that home. Um, Yeah. (laughs) And uh, he goes Uh, goes gets into selling weed, which pretty part of the course for this kind of guy in that kind of town. He finds a sidekick too, who's uh, Lonnie. Oh yes, Lonnie. His his neighbor, who's great. That uh, character reminded me so much of uh, the actual late. Not, I'm not joking at this guy's expense. uh, Ben Best had a vibe of this kind of character in the film, Mm -hmm. where he's just a, you know, another scumbag, but in a pathetic way, not really a flaunting way, like the Simon Rex character. And he steals valor Ste- for a living. Steal valor <laughs> yeah. to get uh, discounts on whatever he's buying, uh, and then he gets caught. Yeah, uh, I love the fact that he keeps uh, because he like he finds someone that's more pathetic than him, which is the I think it's Lonnie, the Lonnie character who thinks he's a star still, who still believes that, and he's like, yeah, I'm on Pornhub, twenty thousand views on the video, he's, and I was yeah, he's bragging I was, about the AVNs. And- <laughs> Yeah, I was voted best blowjob, and then the girl's like, well, isn't the girl that does the blowjob? No, I'm fucking in the mouth. Yeah. I'm the one doing the work. Yeah, so it's that, that type of thing of, like, um, big fish in a tiny town, but no one really believes him, just him, just, like, his little sidekick that he's right. able to fool. Uh, and then they get into small-town shenanigans. Uh, it's very down-to-earth, very... You know, slice of life of, of, like I said, like no one changes. No one really improves their life at all. Uh, and then the ending is kind of open, I think, because I, I don't I don't think that ending is necessarily, well, he made it there. So now he's going to be happily ever after with this girl. And, no, and it's mom. almost impossible. But I mean, here's the yeah. thing. All right. So we're, we're leaving out a big chunk of the movie, which it takes a, a left turn about the midway point because he sells weed yeah. and then he's making some money. He's got a couple thousand dollars, and um, it's probably not even really his money. He probably owes 80% of that to the drug dealer. He's like, I'm taking you guys out for donuts. Mm-hmm. I, you know, he's not, not for lunch, not for dinner. And uh, My they, treat. Yes, my treat. Get whatever you want. <laughs> and cash is like what do you want, a large coffee? Oh, yeah, yeah, cappuccino. <laughs> get her an extra large cappuccino. They get a big get plate the of the largest coffee. <laughs> and it uh, comes out yeah. to about 680 But during that time, he makes eyes with the cashier at the donut shop which is this 17-year-old uh, redhead. And right. uh, it's like, Strawberry. all right, that's the next step. That's where mm. I have to go. And he's like, all right, well, let's get out of here. Keep your voices down. Come on, we got to get out of here. And then he takes them all the way home. He's like, ah, damn, I forgot smokes. I got to go. Listen, I got to go ride my bike back to the donut shop. <laughs> <laughs> and he does it. And it's, of course, closed because now it's like sundown because they walk back. One of them's an 80-year-old woman. Um, so he develops this relationship with the 17-year-old girl. And it doesn't even turn into like, this girl's my my new thing, my new rock or whatever. It's it's kind of that a little bit, but it's more like I got a big idea. I'm going to groom this yeah. girl into being a porn star, and she's going to be yeah. my ticket back into the industry. And it goes to like this weird, <laughs> unconventional, dark place without getting dark. And right. you, you see that this is a talented girl. She knows how to play piano. She can sing well. And... Mm. You see the What's the song? Bi- is it Bye 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 or yes, something? Bye, 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 that bye, you bye, play in the piano? Yeah. Doesn't it start with uh, Backstreet Boys and it ends uh, with the NSYNC? I don't know. Um, I don't know. So you see what his character's progression is and how that falls apart at the end, just like Barry Lyndon, where suddenly the one person he wronged that he really shouldn't have wronged, which is his wife's son, comes back, shoots him in a moment of vulnerability. Yeah. That's what happens here. He tries to be decent and fails because he's so indecent. 
and mm-hmm. it bites him in the ass and gets kicked to the curb because of it. Uh, it is a terrific film. It exceeded my expectations completely, and yeah. I had a lot of fun with it, with that character. So Red Rocket, number two. Yeah, I thought it was going to be just a silly comedy, but it ended up being very grounded and very you know, realistic uh, depiction of a shithead that thinks he's better than he is, mm-hmm. and better than everyone that's around him. He literally uh, says that. He says to her, her then the donut shop girl's then boyfriend, she's now dating in a new tier that's way above you. Oh, and yeah. he brings his parents to go beat the shit. <laughs> then they beat the that shit out of him. Yeah, <laughs> more local uh, local actors. Right. Yeah. 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 Just a, a fat woman with really terrible tattoos all over her body. Looked like stickers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My number one. Are we at one? We are right. That's your number one. Yeah. Okay. So my number one is Censor, which I know uh, you I also haven't seen. Yeah. I love this movie. It. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Again, uh, visual style using uh, vintage uh, technology to show something that well, th- there's not really a specific time frame for, for the movie to happen. Uh, we're we're never shown any type of modern day technology or or, or a specific uh, time that this happens, but um, it's very quirky the way everything looks. Very. Uh, in the kind of the British uh, type of movie, uh, it's very violent at times, and they they go all in with the violence. Uh, the ending is very wacky and and experimental, which I really liked. And they they switch a lot from regular camera and then something that feels like Super Eight or or something that I'm not I'm not a uh, very uh, knowledgeable when it comes to cameras, but that type of look where it's very grainy and 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 vintage, and the story is crazy. It's about this girl that works uh, for the uh, British. What's it called? Uh, uh, where they rate movies to see if it's too violent or if they need to send it like back. Like the MPA, re- right? A rating, yeah, yeah, yeah. To ratings board, that's what it is. Uh, to re-edit it and things like that, and then she discovers that in one of the movies that she saw, uh, she saw an actress that looks a lot like one of her sisters that was kidnapped or, or missing or whatever, and then she just goes on a downward spiral trying to find her. Uh, and the the ending is also very open because you you don't exactly know if she's just gone crazy or if this is actually happening. Uh, but the visual style really got me. I've seen it like three times since, and it's something that. Uh, you know when you watch a movie that you're like fuck i wish i had thought of doing something that looks like this or or something that uses these elements Uh, i felt uh, that a lot while watching this uh the performances are really good uh even though the actors are not really people that are very familiar with there's there's only one who has a very british face that i that i recognize uh but i don't really know his name um but uh, it's the the movie that I enjoyed the most. Uh, the movie that I've seen already like three or four times this year oh, since wow. it came out. Let me see if I can find this oh. guy. Uh, Michael Smiley. That's a terrible uh, name to be stuck with. Yeah. As a <laughs> yeah. professional person. This guy. Ah. Okay, I've seen him before. Uh, probably the Lobster. Ro- yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but he has that that very typical British face oh, he uh, to him does. and hair and everything. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, that 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 one will be my my one. I know that um, reviews have been mixed uh, because it's. I, I don't think it's one of those movies that's for everyone really. But um, the visual style of it, the violence, and the performance from the lead actress, uh, I've really enjoyed. So now I, I've actually <laughs> I've seen that on a number of year end best of lists. So I don't I don't know okay. how mixed it is. It's, it's, if it's mixed, then it's mixed to positive, and that is probably the definite one I I intend on checking out. Um, from your list of 10, or rather not eight and a half uh, from right. the year. Censor has, uh, I think, impressed a lot of people. I know on Red Letter Media, they were uh, you know, commending the filmmaking of it. So uh, yeah, that is definitely one I got to check out. Well, before you move on to yours, I just saw that they put out a video on The Matrix and they were very positive about it. So I don't know. Were they positive about it? Oh, no. When yeah. I was wrapping up yeah. as a keynote uh, today, <laughs> Monkey Jones rushed us off discord so he could watch it because he knew they were gonna shit on it no, what a, what a didn't, dork uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, uh, yeah the, it starts with them saying like mike says a lot of negative things about it and he's like and i fucking loved every minute of it 
Uh, so uh, I didn't they finish it. I only got like 10 minutes in. Less and less reliable yeah. as far as I'm concerned. They've reached the point. They're too old now. I think they they might be edging into too old. It started when Jay right. just couldn't keep up with like Joker, I guess. Um, oh, it, yeah. That started to show cracks. And then Mike coming out about his ghost obsession, his interest in ghost hunters or whatever. Ghost that hunt, was like yeah. the next crack. <laughs> And now it's, it's shit like this that piles up. And when you're in your 40s, look, they're putting out a good pro. I'll watch whatever Best of the Worst episode comes oh, yeah. out or Half in the Bag. Mm-hmm. Believe me, I'm a fan. But their, their word is starting to get less reliable as far as I'm concerned. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. I, or maybe we're growing in different directions where we yeah, don't maybe. agree with I, I, Hey, it could be that too. <laughs> Angry video game yeah. nerd, he grew in his own direction. He's not on, on, on the path well, of anyone he- with taste. He grew in the direction of whoever's writing his videos now. Not really his, I don't think. Right, yeah. <laughs> he's just kind of a tulpa yeah. at this point. Yeah, he's um, the face. Yeah. So, well, good good for him. And his, he, you know, I wish he didn't have a family so he could make a bunch of new videos. It's always the family getting in the way. I've never seen someone throw their family under the bus more. Well, you know, I have daughters now. I can't make a video. Uh-huh. Sure, pal. This is, yeah. this is how you're making money hand over fist. Let's get real. Anyway, yeah, I'm not gonna make these videos. It's just me in the basement because I have to take care of my daughters. All right, maybe you're just out of ideas and you have nothing left to say, which is why you retired the character a couple of years ago and had to bring it back because nobody cared about anything else. Anyway, enough. About I th- you him. know what? I, I think a day will come <laughs> where you see Justin Silverman take on the role of the angry video game nerd, or it, it'll, it'll be like a Blues Clue situation where at a certain point Steve gets weeded out and in comes what was it joe and there was a filipino it's his man. cousin yeah it's cousin a joe, cousin. Brother joe. <laughs> they got joe kumia for blues clues um all right my yeah. number one of the year is a movie from a director <laughs> whose work i'm not familiar with at all from a director named ben hosey and that movie is called private chat pvt chat the film that stars peter vack at the master of come on instagram Julia Fox, Buddy Duress, and features the likes of uh, uh, Anna Kachian from Red Scare. And I believe Dasha also has a very small role in this movie. And uh, I think it's a great and very underrated film. Nobody's putting this on their their best of the year list. It kind of snuck out there extremely quiet at the beginning of the year. Just went direct to online. I don't think there was a physical media release. It premiered in 2020 at some festival got buried for a period of time. And I thought, this is going to be the same thing as Flinch, where they're using Safety Brother actors, and it's just going to be a, a knockoff. It was not that at all. There is a new style of New York filmmaking that is coming about, and I think Scary 61st belongs to this category, but Private Chat, much more so, uh, has created this new sphere, where it's post-Sex in the City, it's post-Girls, it's post Everything that you came before, this sterile New York City. And I think it showcases it very well. And it also showcases the nature of online relationships when you're flirting mm-hmm. with somebody. And also, if the, you know, Julia Fox plays a, a cam girl in this movie. And mm-hmm. Peter Vack uh, plays his character, Jack, who is a compulsive online gambler. And so he's just constantly online. So for him, flirting with a girl, I guess, is, you know, giving her tokens in a in a chat right. roulette or whatever it might be, um, style website. And right. um, he finds out that the cam girl that he goes to most frequently lives in New York City because he sees her in Chinatown. And he starts obsessing over her, trying to follow her, stalking her a little bit, getting into her apartment, hiding in her apartment while she's arguing with her boyfriend or whatever. And uh, just trying to build a situation in which they can meet through natural terms, which is probably very difficult if you're a cam girl and a customer, I would imagine. Um, right. And, and so you're, Richard you're, Ramirez. Yeah, it really is. But he's mostly harmless. He's a little bit obsessive and a weirdo, but he's not a bad guy in this movie. And it does end with them meeting up. You see him unsimulated jacking off in front of her, and they're both naked, and there's sex, and they get together. So that's private so, chat. No, um, another horny movie. It, yes. That, well, what did I say? I was I was uh, <laughs> spiting myself earlier saying, no, what are you talking about? Huh? Actually, no, the top two <laughs> movies of the year. Yeah. Sex is a big component of them. So 
You yeah. see, you see penises in both of them. Great. You do see penises yeah. in both movies. That's right. <laughs> That's right. You do see Simon Rex's cock flopping around as he's running down the street, and I believe you do see Peter Vac's uh, penis in this film as well. It's a. Uh, it has the similar vibe to Spree to me, where oh, yes, yeah, uh, where it's it's very under the radar uh, visually. I don't know if they're very similar because of the way that Spree was shot, but the hype that it has is from a very specific group of people that are not the conventional people that you go to, I guess, uh, that, uh, um, you know, people that are actually searching for interesting independent movies. Uh, I haven't seen it. Uh, I have an interest because I know that she's very naked in it, and that's cool. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's definitely one that I'll check out. Uh, I changed my mind on Spree because I remember I told you that I started watching it and I couldn't make it past 10 minutes because I thought it was annoying, but then, you know, that's the point of it. So yeah. uh, that's another one that uh, I feel like it's a especially because of the way that it was shot usually that gimmick is just used as a gimmick without a lot behind it uh and that one also worked with works really well and it's it's in a similar vein to this one where like i said uh you're not gonna find the jeremy johns talking about uh this movie but if you find like the right people to listen to that actually search this obscure independent movies then you'll get the, the praise that, that uh, a weird indie movie like this will get. Uh, so it's definitely one that I'll check out. <clears throat> Terrific. Well, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll do a show on censor and private chat at some point, since you haven't seen my number one, I haven't seen your number one. And they're both kind of similarly themed enough in that it's mm -hmm. technology of some kind, the screen is involved. Right. Uh, but yeah, Julie Fox is great in this movie. Uh, she's not a one-trick pony if you go by this in Uncut Gems, but I don't know. Unfortunately, I don't know how much uh, you know of a career a lot of these safety uh, actors will have in the long run. Seems like they just got plucked for the right project at the right time, but she's mm -hmm. great in this film. Peter Vac could easily be a star, and he's not right now, but maybe he will be at some point. He, he's kind of sleazy in a similar way to Simon Rex, but he's not an idiot. He's a very sharp guy, uh, oozes charisma and personality in this film. And again, I can't recommend it enough. Private chat. Check it out. It's PVT chat. PVT chat. Number one for the right. year. That's it. There we go. All right. There we Yeah, that was that was uh somehow I think it was faster than our ten watched yeah. in twenty twenty one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess we have more time to assimilate those movies, have more to say about them. Sure. Uh, the other ones. But uh yeah, I'm pretty happy with my list. This is a much better year than last year. I remember how much I struggled coming up with even five last year. And hopefully oh, yeah. this coming year, once your country decides to stop being that fucking stupid. Because, That's not happening. Because so I'm, I'm fucking... I want to write something that happens in the school. I'm not going to write something that school with like plastic in between students and shit. Like that, that sucks. You know, everything you, about on, modern... You an idea for a movie in a school? Yeah, in a college. You know, like a, take taking from from my film school experience you know uh, there's a lot of things that i wrote on notebooks jokes and things like that that i'm, I'm revisiting uh, recently but as a feature it yeah okay but if but if uh if things don't go back to normal at least slightly then it's just gonna either have to be uh not set on the present or you know it's gonna be a difficult production it's gonna have to be a very small a crew of just us again because otherwise it's going to be a pain in the ass to get actors and shit so hopefully this retardedness ends quickly i can firmly or say this year. i am retired from acting until uh 2022 <laughs> yeah i don't want to act that's why i want to write something because yeah, i don't want to be in front of the camera new year's eve joke that's all that was i don't want to be look i oh, i oh, yeah, oh, oh, see i didn't want to get upset so i didn't even well, <laughs> Dude, I'm gonna, everybody knows I'm going to play the joke. college student when we do this when I'm yeah. 37 years old. Yep. Fucking, yeah, I, already, I look like I aged 10 <laughs> years in a year. Um, yeah, first, you This was the like first that. year. This was the first year that people, a.k.a. Kino, and someone else also said, damn, you look old, huh? Like, <laughs> what? Like, excuse me? <laughs> I, like, uh, he said something like, uh, so you know how I'm, uh, I look young because I look younger than you. Low res. I was like, I mean, all right, you didn't have right. to hammer it home. Look, we're, we're five years apart. I'm still, look, I'm still in my early 30s here. I think Kino looks very young in pictures he takes. In certain photos, Kino leave. has a thing about <laughs> him where he will look either 20 years old or he will look 45 years old. And it yeah. depends on the lighting, depends on 
what the style of photo is. You know, if he's far away, then that's a kid. If he's not far away, yeah. I don't know. I don't know how old that guy is. Yeah, it's a Florida uh, 20-something-year-old. Yeah. You know, a lot yeah. of sun. and Yeah. <laughs> I was just looking at my 2020 list. It's another round, Family Romance LLC, Siberia, Tommaso, and that's really where the list stops. But I, for, for a top 10, the trip to Greece uh, got factored in as number five, Spree is six, the way back is seven. That's really w- what would be the cutoff because I like those two films. I would say, sure, yeah, five and six. The way back, that was, I mean, look, that was fine. It was a good movie, but uh, not, another one that just would be, never be in the top 10. It wouldn't be in the top no. 20 any other year. Possessor. Would Siberia, Siberia and Tommaso be there too? Yeah, I, I, I thought Siberia was very well done. I, I liked the message in the general subtext of Tommaso more than Siberia's, although Siberia I thought was visually uh, yeah. well, well composed. Uh, Jasper Mall was number nine, and then Fat Man was number ten. Much better. Yeah, game. yeah, rough, rough year. At least, uh, I guess productions are kind of back, right? Uh, yeah, ish. I would say so. so. Uh, they're just kind of, I mean, they're not ignoring COVID. They're going through all the protocols and everything else. Look what happened on the Alec Baldwin set because they didn't do proper protocols. Everybody walked off, and a woman died, and a man got shot. Yeah, you know who's ignoring thing. COVID protocols? Headshot. No, what is yeah. it? Forgotten genre, so. Forgotten genre. <laughs> What, <Yeah>. COVID? <laughs> I don't even know what that is. Listen, what, alcohol? I, what to the, the MO, your hands? The MO of forgotten genres, and I was going to put out a video saying this, is, um, you know, it doesn't matter. None of that matters. What ma- matters yeah. is making the movie. People might die. Yeah. That's a fact. Maybe we're not going to put duct tape over the knife next time. Maybe we're just going to go right in there. And end some lives it's, for cinema. This actor we just met. Yes, this, <laughs> this you, actor you we out here barely know. Minutes? How about a knife to the throat, fella? <laughs> How do you feel about spending? How about the next you take of your years shirt of off emergency. in this thirty-degree weather for about three hours, and we'll see what happens? How about we see yeah. you get sick in real time? Did yeah. he end up getting sick at all? You no, he know. just got a rash. He, he got a rash from uh. the blood. Or from the prosthetic, the latex. Uh, no, look. Yeah, we're just we well, look at forgotten genres. We conduct a very safe set, but we will shoot in a location illegally. We will have illegal practices on the set in order to make mm-hmm. the movie happen. It's called art. It's called art. Uh, God damn it. We would we would sleep at uh, during the day so we can shoot at three in the morning so there's no one around and no one gives us trouble. Well, we didn't uh, really we, do that this time around. We played it. Look, not, I think by comparison, this was a much more thought out and well functioning machine in spite of little yeah. hiccups here and there on one day I was, um, I was thinking i was thinking more of me you know the person that doesn't have a license driving in greater boston <laughs> at three in the morning well, uh maybe again, that bit <laughs> an, anything to capture the moment anything to yeah. you know compel compel uh audiences with the the cinema that's on screen it's so cinema yeah, yes that's I, what it is. our both of our number ones for 2023 will be mass state lottery we will be taking a cue from paul schrader so just yeah. just spoiler alert right there uh also it, it has been discussed that uh this this film of ours will be discussed on a future monkey jones podcast so get ready for that he's gonna be the first critic the screeners will go mm-hmm. out around j- july We'll get Jeremy Johns. We'll get Chris Stuckman. We'll get the whole round right. on board. Mass State Lottery, 2022. Then we can put mm-hmm. this movie behind us and it's on to the next. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. When's the trailer coming out, the new one? You announced that, right? Ooh, well, we'll see. We'll, no? We'll All see. Right. I'm not telling you right okay. now. I'll tell you off mic. Okay. Yeah. I don't want to so. say things and then have to change around dates. Or yeah, 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 yeah. I Simple as that. Yeah. Uh, also, a little thing for Forgotten Genres is we do have a music video coming out with Mario Cuomo. That'll be a big thing for early 2022. All right. So music videos, do people enjoy those anymore? I'm just a callback. To yeah, yeah, Kyle. Question. Ah, well. <laughs> that'll, that'll be our first show of 2022. Resident Evil, Welcome to Raccoon City with the director of The Perfect Wife, Kyle Girardi. I'm looking forward to that. Thank you guys for listening mm-hmm. to movies for yet another year. This is going to be technically... It's going to be year five? No. No. It, no, not even close. Well, Actually, full it's the fifth. Three. It's technically, it's been 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, 22. That's five years, but it's really only going to be about, we just hit three years of doing the show back in November. But you, not regularly, though. You I have, have what, done two years. Two years, right. 
because it wasn't like a weekly thing before, right? It was like a monthly episode, no, no, no. I think, no, when you it, first it was, started? It was weekly, yeah. I did uh, oh, 33 it? episodes without you. Okay. Although you covered for me for a couple of episodes because there were some some weeks where I was just like, when I was recording these on my own week to week, I had Hans here sub in for me a couple of weeks where I couldn't do it, and Jake also did uh, quite a few episodes. And then uh, you guys did one together without me, so uh, you've probably only done like 15 episodes Uh that, that, that or haven't done 15 episodes of the entire list and I, I mean this is pretty close to 180 now so you've been on for 150 episodes at least cool I was, uh waiting for that cake yeah to celebrate. yeah yeah well <laughs> you gotta i sent you a plaque in the mail when we hit a hundred right mm-hmm. it's costa rican mail so I, i'll get it some yeah. time yeah, yeah. i said five Let's to six them. weeks or something i don't know <laughs> we did almost 100 episodes just this year Right? That's, That's what I was going to ask. Nuts. How many episodes a year? So uh, this is, I year. think, this might be 178 or 180. And at the start of the year, we were at about 90. So we are we did a lot of episodes this year. I set a goal uh, last year that said, I'm going to put out 200 videos in 2021 and surpass that by a lot. So yeah, 2022... So join- Join the Patreon. Join the Patreon, so that... patreon.com slash Lores. <laughs> Join that. I'll, maybe I'll edit that really at the beginning get, of the show. We should really get better at plugging this at the beginning. Or maybe Surfshark in the middle. VPN. Not, yeah, not two hours in. No, so hopefully you're still listening, but uh, yeah. That would be nice. Um, yeah, <laughs> patreon.com slash Lores. And uh, I thank you guys. Let's, let's look forward to another year of movies. Barring, I'm not even going to say, because nowadays some dark magic in play where you can jinx things very, very badly. But here's what I'll say. For 2022, Mass State Lottery released. We're going to start production on our second film for Forgotten Genres. Don't even know what that is right now. It could be something that I'm producing or directing, or maybe we're going to do Hans' script if he finishes it. We'll see. It's going to be a big year. It's going to be a massive fucking don't, year. And don't do acid so that... Do not. Do, you know, do not. If you, especially if you have <laughs> mental health problems, don't do acid. <laughs> I look, I learned the hard way when I was 23 years old. Don't do a goddamn thing. Have a drink every so often. Maybe smoke a cigarette. Some people don't like that. Some people I'm around frequently don't like that. But right. you know what? You can enjoy yourself. There's safe ways to enjoy yourself without jeopardizing your mental health. Mm. That's what I always say. Yeah. Yeah. S- same. Don't Didn't you do start drinking tonight breakfast. for the first time in three Listen, weeks? Listen, sh- it's fucking the last day of the year. I, I yeah. I've yeah. actually lost like eight pounds this month just for not drinking. So I think I'm That's just going to really keep that going. It's just tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Just Me? not drink every day. Hey. I probably put on 15 pounds. Man, I, I feel <laughs> look like a real slob. I had five <laughs> slices of pizza for dinner just only two nights ago. You're, you're getting to the Casavetes age. Where yeah, I get the blood ball, guys. It's, like it's, all food. it's not my liver giving out. It's just I'm, I'm fat. I'm a fat slob. No, I'm doing it for, uh, it's the Norm McDonald joke. Right, I'm doing it for a role. For Hans's film, I have to gain yeah. 100 pounds. I yeah. have to look like you Orson have to be Welles. Me, so. Yes. Yeah, you have to be um, me at 27. <clears throat> that's right. It's very uh, Red Rocket, but I'm going to be playing Hans, you know. Anyway, yeah. that's been movies for this year. Thank you for listening.